Hey, April. Yeah, Simon. Why did the duck refuse to go to a restaurant? I don't know, Simon. Why did the duck refuse to go to a restaurant? Because it refused to see a bill. (laughs) (laughs) T and indeed he. (laughs) Oh, dear. I do love those things. Hi, everybody, and welcome to a brand new episode of Eat My Globe, a podcast about things you didn't know you didn't know about food. Well, today, as you can probably tell, we're going to be looking at the restaurant and all the types of eating establishment that people have visited over time. We will be looking at the ancient world, such as ancient Greece and Rome. At the period of the Middle Ages, at the French who created the word restaurant in the 1700s and 1800s, at China, and then the hustle and bustle of the United States of America, which introduced things such as the fast food, the cafeteria, diners, drive-ins, and automats, and others along the way, all of which help workers get back to their jobs more quickly. Alongside that, we'll take a look at the recent COVID-19 pandemic and how that changed restaurant eating habits and the business of actually starting a restaurant. So if you've ever had reservations about this Food History podcast before, don't fret because our delivery is on time. Oh dear, this is my wife trying to... Anyway... So why don't you come in from the cold? Let me take your coat and show you to a table for the history of the restaurant. Whereas we normally begin with where the name of our subject of our episode comes from, today we're going to head back a bit and start with the ancient times of Greece and Rome. In ancient Greece, there were societies and resting places called leche. The Dictionary of Greek and Roman Antiquities defines leche as conversations. So it was a place where people would get together and share conversations and political discussions. Google translates the Greek word for leche as a club. One ancient person described it as, quote, where the idle resorted for conversation, the poor to find warmth and shelter, At Athens, it is said that there were several, end quote. Sparta also had them. As Plutarch put it, the leche was, quote, for business also, but especially for the relaxation of the citizens, in contrast to their severe bodily exercises, end quote. Every tribe would have one of these leches, and Unsurprisingly, these leches served food to people. In addition to the leches, ancient Greeks would also go to a kapelia, which were bars that obviously served booze, but they also served food to regular folks who could pay. By the 5th century BCE, the ancient Greeks could also frequent places known as fatnai, These were, as Encyclopedia Britannica describes them as, quote, sumptuous Greek establishments that served a local and transient clientele of traders, envoys, and government officials, end quote. In ancient Rome, the regular folks tended to eat out more regularly because they had to if they were from the lower strata of society and did not have time to cook or even have access to full kitchens. In Pompeii, a recently discovered thermopolium, or, quote, hot drinks counter, end quote, has revealed how ancient Romans would stop outside to have a drink and eat some food. According to NPR, the food on offer at these thermopolia, the plural version of thermopolium, would have included, quote, duck, goat, pig, fish and snails in earthen pots, 
sometimes combined in the same dish, end quote. According to Business Insider, other dishes served at a typical thermopolia would have included, quote, lentils, meat, cheese, and a type of warmed spice wine called kalida. Fish sauce known as garum and nuts also may have been handy snacks to eat on the go, end quote. The area is not unlike a fast food counter we might expect today. The counter where people would eat would have bright illustrations of the food and drink on offer, like a menu board, I would imagine. The counter would also have a large space with round holes where dolia or large pots would be placed. The food inside the dolia would be served to the willing buyers. And like modern-day fast food restaurants, some of these thermopolia would also have an area for their customers to dine in. The most recently excavated Thermopolia in Pompeii was situated by a busy square where I imagine people would stop to buy a meal or a snack, a bit like they would today. By the way, I did an episode on dining in ancient Rome in season five, so if you missed that episode or would like to know more about what they wanted to eat, Do check it out. In some parts of ancient Rome, these thermopolia may have also been known as capone, taberne, or popine, where the capone was like an inn that served food, the taberne was like a tavern that also served food, and the popine was more like a greasy spoon, which we call it in England. Apparently, these type of dining establishments were frequented by some unsavoury characters. The Roman poet Juvenal referred to these establishments as a cook shop. Quote, Send your legate to Ostia and Caesar, but search for him in some big cook shop. There you will find him, lying cheek by jowl beside a cutthroat, in the company of bargees, thieves, and runaway slaves beside hangmen and coffin makers, or of some eunuch priest lying drunk with idle timbrels. Here is Liberty Hall. Once cup serves for everybody. No one has a bed to himself, nor a table apart from the rest. End quote. Juvenal further describes these types of places as having, quote, the savour of tripe in the reeking cookshop, end quote, Ugh. and Quintus Horatius Flaccus, or Horus as he is known to us today, simply described them as, quote, ill-kept and greasy, <laughs> end quote, which reminds me of The Greasy Spoon Cafes, a term even now used in England about a working man's cafe. You know the type that serves the most fantastic English breakfast. I used to go to one as a student in the start of the 1980s that served breakfast that was cheaper than my college. The owner had teaspoons that were chained to the wall in case of stealing, absolutely he did, and would come along and give you your breakfast and then give the spoons at each table a once-over with a damp cloth. Oh, every now and again. Happy times. Oh, I love that. (laughs) Anyway, back to taverns, which is a term, according to Merriam-Webster, that comes from the Latin, taberna, which I'm told meant hut or shop, and was first used in the 14th century. These were probably more drinking establishments that served food, rather than food places that served drink. But food was served. Some of these included places such as Ireland's Sean's Bar, which is the oldest bar in Europe, and has been around since 900 CE, and the Bingley Arms in Leeds, England, which has been around since 953 or maybe 905 CE, both of which are establishments that I have visited on a couple of occasions. According to Encyclopedia Britannica, 
These ancient taverns were known as a place for thieves, cutthroats, and undesirables, but they provided a meal at a fixed time of day. By the 16th century, meals were delivered to people of all classes for a shilling or show per meal, with wines and ales as extras. End quote. These copone and taberna became ale houses, which, according to Encyclopedia Britannica, were managed by women who were known as alewives. People would know if a building was an alehouse if they saw a broom that was stuck out above the door. On to China to check out where the Monday restaurant lightly started. According to Katie Rawson and Elliot Shaw, authors of Dining Out, A Global History of Restaurants, the very first style of restaurants that we might know today was in the 12th century CE in the Chinese cities of Kaifang and Hangzhou, which were the southern and northern capitals of the Song dynasty. Rawson and Shaw go on to say that the restaurants started in those areas due to one, their size, each city had about a million people, two, the currency allowed for smaller denominations, three, the government was becoming made up of bureaucrats as opposed to aristocrats, and four, trade was abundant, which meant outsiders visited their city. They also say that, quote, the notion that food from other places would be made available to travellers and to people from those regions who made the city their home became another impetus. The regional cuisine that characterised the restaurant culture in the 21st century, authentic foods from various parts of the world, was a fully formed part of these metropolises of Kaifeng and Hangzhou, end quote. As Meng Yunglao described a restaurant in 1147 as follows, quote, Generally, the largest restaurants were called partial tea food. They served such things as head stew, stalactite stew, pressed meats, baked sesame buns, lamb kid, large and small bones, kidney in reduced sauce, brass skin noodles, broad cut noodles with ginger, twice cooked noodles, cold noodles, chess piece pasta, and baked flour product. If one were to make it a full tea meal, then one added a head strew of pickled vegetables. Each of these restaurants had a courtyard with eastern and western corridors, which were designated as seating compartments. When the guests sat down, a single person holding chopsticks and paper, Zushi, then asked all of the seated guests for their order. End quote. Wow, that sounds like a really great meal in a modern day restaurant. I definitely want to try all the noodles on offer. Before the term restaurant became the norm for what we call places where people go out to eat, Merriam Webster says that as dining out began to develop, people called these places some pretty basic but descriptive names, such as, quote, eating house, victualling house, cook shop, treating house, suttling house, which was especially for soldiers, and chop shop. <laughs> End quote. It was to France, however, where we have to look at where the actual name of restaurant became the name we now know today. What may come as a surprise to many people is that the term restaurant does not come from a place, but from a foodstuff, soup to be exact. The legend starts with a story, which was initially published in 1853. The story goes that in 1765, a soup maker called Boulanger also known as Champ de Oiseau or Chant Oiseau, opened a shop in Paris near the Louvre Museum that became known for his meat-based soups called Bouillon Restaurant 
or in French, restorative broths in English. See, the restaurant in Boulanger's Brion Restaurant is taken from the Latin term restaurare, which is defined as to restore or to renew. As John Robert Pitt writes in The Rise of the Restaurants, a section in the book entitled Food, a Culinary History from Antiquity to the Present, quote, Ever since the late Middle Ages, the word restaurant had been used to describe any of a variety of rich bouillon made from chicken, beef, roots of one sort or another, onions, herbs, and according to some recipes, spices, crystallized sugar, toasted bread, barley, butter, and even exotic ingredients such as dried rose petals, Damascus grapes, and amber. End quote. They all sound delicious to me. As an aside, being a theologian from my student days, I also liked that Boulanger's shop had a welcoming sign that read, quote, Venite ad mi omnes, qui stomaco labores et ego vos restaurabo, end quote, which, as Merriam Webster puts it, means, quote, Come to me, all who suffer from pain of the stomach, and I will restore you. A punning allusion to both the restorative quality of his broths and Jesus' invitation found in Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. End quote. And according to John Robert Pitt and the National Geographic, everything was fine in Boulanger's shop selling world until Boulanger started to serve other dishes in addition to his healthy soups. He served a dish that involved a leg of lamb in a white sauce, or pied de mouton à la sauce poulette, that his competitors considered a stew. This lamb dish saw him being sued in court by the traiteurs, or the guild of caterers, who cooked food for people without a kitchen. Fortunately for Boulanger, he won the case by claiming that he separately prepared the sauce and then added it to the cooked lamb leg, which is apparently different to how the caterers prepared a dish. The caterers lost, and Boulanger won. The rest, as they say, is history. The word restaurant began to be used in France and other parts of Europe, and we can still see the term Trattur being used in Italy, in establishments such as those called Trattoria. Now, we don't know if this is just one of those culinary tales that people share because they are just good stories. And in fact, Rebecca Spang, author of The Invention of the Restaurant, Paris and the Modern Gastronomic Culture, puts the creation of the restaurants with a man named Mathurin. Rosé de Chant Oiseau. And I don't know whether Rebecca Sprang's Mathurin Rosé de Chant Oiseau is the same as Jean Robert Pitt's Boulanger, who he says is also known as Champ de Oiseau or Chant Oiseau. To be honest, we probably won't know the truth for this, but it's still a great story. In 1782 or 1789, according to other sources, the first luxury restaurant began to serve meals in Paris on Rue de Richelieu. Antoine Beauvier owned the restaurant he called Le Grand Taverne de Londres. As a well-known expert on Epicurean matters, he also authored La de Cuisinier, which he published in 1814. Author and gastronome Jean Anthelme Briat Savarin says in his book Physiology du Gout or a Handbook of Gastronomy that Bovier's restaurant was quote, elegant and his waiters are well dressed. He has a good cellar and a first rate cuisine. Carriages of all kinds and of every nation were constantly to be seen before his establishment, 
End quote. I wish I was one of those as well. Briat Savarin also describes Beauvillier as a fantastic host. Apparently, Beauvillier would often, quote, pointed out a dish which might be passed over, another that should be taken without delay, ordered a third of which no one had thought, sent for wine from a cellar of which he alone kept the key, and all this in so pleasant and courteous a manner that such orders seemed so many personal favours on his part. End quote. By 1789, restaurants in Paris started serving meals from a la carte menus. Some of these menus could include, for example, quote, 12 soups, 24 side dishes, 15 to 20 entrees of beef, 20 entrees of mutton, 30 entrees of poultry and game, 15 or 20 of veal, 12 of pastry, 24 of fish, 15 roasts, 50 entremont, 50 desserts, end quote. Now that's a huge menu. Interestingly though, according to Brillier Savron, the ingredients may have primarily come from France, but they could also have come from Germany, Spain, Italy, Russia, and as far as Asia, with rice, sago, curry, soy, and the Americas with chocolate, vanilla, sugar, sweet potatoes, and more. There were dining places in France and England that did provide communal meals. Around the 15th century in France, these were known as table d'hôte. And in 18th century England, these were known as ordinaires. These were not really the same restaurants as we would know them today because the meal was served at a certain time only and the diners did not get to choose what to eat. I don't know if I would have liked that. At the beginning of the 19th century, there were around 500 restaurants in Paris alone. But soon thereafter, the restaurants began to spread to the rest of Europe. In London the oldest continuing operating restaurant that still exists today is Rules, which started as a purveyor of oysters. It opened in 1798. I have been there many, many times, and dining there reeks of history where the likes of Charles Dickens have eaten there. It is now known for serving fantastic game. For those who have watched Downton Abbey, which a period piece set in the early 1900s, Rules Restaurant has made a few appearances on the show, particularly when the aristocratic Crawleys were in town. Mm. Around 1851, an American visitor to London made the following restaurant recommendations. Quote, In London, how and where to dine must, in a great measure, depend on the day's and evening's amusement. If business require attendance in the city or pleasure to the opera or theatre, a spot suitable to the neighbourhood should be selected. If the digestive organs are somewhat impaired, a light French dinner is preferable to a substantial English one. If, on the contrary, a man has been taking strong exercise all day and has the appetite of a Saxon. Our indigenous dishes of beefsteak and mutton chops will be duly appreciated and can be obtained at any of the numerous restaurants and shop houses which now abound. End quote. Oh. The author goes on to note that it was unusual for women to be allowed to dine on their own, or even with their husbands. Quote, A want of long-standing still exists in London, and that is the difficulty of finding restaurants where strangers of the gentler sex may be taken to dine. 
It is true that some have been opened where gentlemen may take their wives and daughters, but it has not yet become a recognised custom, although at Blackwall, Greenwich, Hampton Court, Windsor, Slough, Richmond, ladies are to be found as in the Parisian cafes and in London at Varese in Pall Mall, Regent Street. But to give a private dinner with ladies, it is necessary to go to the Albion or London Tavern, where nothing can exceed the magnificent of the rooms. End quote. Around the early to mid-1870s, a Frenchman named Hippolyte Adolphe Taine noted in his Notes on England that the British food was not good. Quote, On trying their cookery, which, excepting that of their very fine clubs, and of the continental English who keep a French or Italian cook, the cooking has no savour. I have purposely dined in 20 taverns, from the lowest to the highest in London and elsewhere. I got large positions of fat, meat and vegetables without sauce. One is amply and wholesomely fed, but one has no pleasure in eating. End quote. Ouch. In 1830, the first fine dining restaurant in the United States opened. It was in New York City and was operated by the Del Monaco family. The Del Monaco family created their own farm in Brooklyn so they could get what they needed, including, according to Dining A Global History, quote, Belgian endive, aubergine and artichokes, end quote. And the cellar, had nearly 16,000 bottles of wine. We chatted about Delmonico and other restaurants that changed America with our friend and Yale professor Paul Friedman back in season one, so make sure you check that out. And according to him, Delmonico's was, quote, the first restaurant to offer a high level of service and a very large menu. Baked Alaska was invented there. So Delmonico was, for 75 years or so, the most noticed restaurant. And so the dishes that it invented spread out beyond just the restaurant to become recognized specialities of many restaurants across the country, end quotes. I have dined at Delmonico's back in the day. I remember enjoying the steaks there and another dish invented by Delmonico chefs, the Lobster Newburg, a very rich dish made with lobster, cream, butter, Madeira and eggs. Very, very delicious. Uh. Now, I also discuss the origins of this dish on the Eat My Globe episode on the history of the lobster. So do check that out too. Back to restaurants. Often, when I am thinking about American dining, I think of some of the innovations that my new home has come up with over the years. Things like cafeterias or diners or fast food, drive-ins or drive-throughs and automats. So let's have a look at those. Cafeterias are restaurants where basically people serve themselves from a counter where dishes are laid out. The first self-service restaurant is believed to have started in Kansas City, Missouri in 1891 at the Young Women's Christian Association. Although the Hartford Courant says this style of dining establishment may have originated in 1885 in New York. Moreover, according to the LA Times, the term cafeteria was first used in 1893 by a man called John Kruger when he opened his restaurant in Chicago. Whenever or wherever this type of restaurant originated, cafeterias soon became popular by the 1900s. Apparently, its popularity started in 1905, when a woman called Helen Mosher opened a cafeteria 
in Los Angeles and advertised that she served, quote, food that can be seen, end quote, and that it required, quote, no tips, end quote. Apparently, this style of restaurant was appealing because soon more cafeterias opened up. Let's move on to diners, which the BBC calls, quote, a quintessential American experience, end quote. It is believed that diners originated in Providence, Rhode Island in 1872. An entrepreneur called Walter Scott used a lunch wagon drawn by a horse to serve food at night. By 1887, the wagons became rolling restaurants and were called lunch cars after a gentleman called Samuel Jones added chairs. According to Sarah Safian at Smithsonian Magazine, they later be called dining cars and finally abbreviated to diner. So there you go. Moving on to fast food. Encyclopedia Britannica defines it as, quote, mass-produced food product designed for quick and efficient preparation and distribution that is sold by certain restaurants, concession stands and convenience stores. Fast food is perhaps most associated with chain restaurants, end quote. The first fast food chain, started in Wichita, Kansas in 1921, and they called it White Castle. You've probably heard of it. It served burgers at the price of five cents. The popularity of the fast food restaurant did not explode, however, until after the end of World War II, which was then when suburban living, freeways and cars became more prevalent, while the first fast food chain may have started in Kansas. The Californian Tourism Board at Visit California has proclaimed that California is, quote, the birthplace of fast food, end quote. That's because so many of the fast food chains we still know today originated in California. Places such as McDonald's, which started in 1940, In-N-Out, which started in 1948, Jack in the Box, which started in 1951, Carl's Jr., which started in 1956, Wiener Schnitzel, which started in 1961, Taco Bell, which started in 1962, Del Taco, which started in 1964, Panda Express, which started in 1973, and many others. According to Ibis World Today, there are more than 536,825 fast food restaurants in the world. So, now let's talk about drive-in restaurants. These are a particularly American form of restaurant. Food and Wine describes this type of restaurant as, quote, a drive-in is essentially the lazy person's dining in. It is going out but on your terms. You pull onto the lot, you flash your lights, a car hop comes running and takes your order, and you kick back and relax, letting it all come to you on a tray that can be fixed rather cleverly right to the windowsill. Voila! Fine dining, mid-century, American style. End quote. According to History.com, The first known drive-in was The Pig Stand, which sold barbecue and which first opened in 1921 between Dallas and Fort Worth. But soon, drive through restaurants became more popular with business owners and customers. Business owners liked drive throughs because they were more profitable. They did not need to hire as many employees like car hops and they could sell food to more people. Similarly, Customers liked them because they could get their food more quickly. drive throughs not only changed the accessibility of fast food, but also changed car design. Car makers took note of the popularity of drive throughs and by the 1980s, many cars added cup holders as a feature. In-N-Out, which again started in 1948 in Southern California, is believed to be 
the pioneer of the drive through restaurant. I must say that I do enjoy their double-double cheeseburger with grilled onions, animal style, every so often. To translate, that involves two beef patties with mustard, grilled onions, and their special sauce. And finally, let's talk about automats, which the New York Times once described as, quote, the waiterless cafeterias, end quote. Automats are restaurants in the sense that one could buy food, but are more like vending machines in the sense that one chooses food displayed behind a glass-covered window, then buys the food by putting one's money in an enclosed kiosk, which then releases the pre-prepared food that one takes to a table. Automats may at first seem like an American invention, but they are not. The first automat, called Cuisisana, opened in Berlin in 1895. Apparently, it served sandwiches, wines, and coffee. But in 1902, Joseph Horn and Frank Haddart opened one in Philadelphia. It soon became very popular once they opened a branch in New York City's Times Square in 1912. At its peak, Horn and Haddart had 70 locations, making it the biggest restaurant chain in the world at the time. Despite the absence of waiters, automats actually employed many cooks, dishwashers, and the people who stocked and restocked dishes in the glass-covered windows. Freshly prepared dishes on offer included mac and cheese, chicken pot pie, and baked beans. It is interesting to note, during the COVID-19 pandemic, automats started to come back. For example, a restaurant in Jersey City allowed customers to order food, and once ready, the customer could pick it up from a designated delivery box. This updated automat, however, did not offer pre-made food, and instead, all foods were freshly made after a customer placed their order. Which brings us to today's world. As we are heading out of that recent pandemic, we need to say how restaurants and takeouts will begin to deal with the chaos that brought to everything, including restaurants. Let's start with takeout. This history dates back at least to the Thermopolia of ancient Rome. There, as we discussed, ancient Romans would have easily been able to buy food to go. A fun story about takeout happened in 1889 in Italy. The story goes that King Umberto of Italy and his wife, Queen Margarita, apparently became tired of fine dining. So they summoned pizza from Pizzeria Brandi. Now, legend goes that the Queen really liked the pizza she ordered, made with white mozzarella, red tomatoes and green basil, which coincidentally, or not, had all the colours of the Italian flag, that that pizza became named after her as the Margarita Pizza. So that's the story of the royal takeout. In the United States, according to food historian Emmeline Rood, food delivery started happening in the 1700s when hotels in the colonies offered a service where, quote, families may every day be provided with plates of any dish that may happen to be cooked that day by sending their servants for the same, end quote. As for modern day takeout we are familiar with today in the U.S., that happened in 1922 when a Chinese restaurant in Los Angeles called Kin Chu started offering a delivery service. Kin Chu started with an advertisement campaign saying, quote, the only place on the West Coast making and delivering real Chinese dishes, end quote. And here is a fun fact you can use to bore people with at dinner parties. In the East Coast during the early 1900s, many restaurants in places like New York City sold oysters, scallops and other seafood to go. They were then packaged in oyster pails, which were white folded cardboard containers manufactured by a company called Bloomer Brothers. That company became the Regal Paper Company in the 1960s and then became 
fold pack in the 1970s. Today, fold pack still makes the same white folded cardboard containers that were once used as oyster pails, but are now used as Chinese to go containers. So there you go. Your typical Chinese takeout box started its life as an oyster pail. According to DoorDash, the food delivery service in 2023, the most popular food ordered for delivery in the US were, quote, one, fries, two, chicken quesadillas, three, mozzarella sticks, four, garlic naan, five, spicy chicken sandwich, six, pepperoni pizza, seven, chips and queso, eight, traditional wings, nine, cob salad, ten, fried rice, end quote, which shows us the wide variety of foods from around the world now available at various restaurants in the US. In the DoorDash list alone, the variety of dishes ordered tells us that Americans love ordering Mexican food, Chinese food, Indian food, Italian food, and more from restaurants. This is unsurprising. In fact, if I leave my house now in LA, I am within walking distance of, to name a few, a Chinese restaurant, an Indian restaurant, a Thai restaurant, a Cuban restaurant, a Japanese restaurant, an Indonesian restaurant, a Mexican restaurant, a Nepalese restaurant, a Burmese restaurant, an Italian restaurant, an El Salvadoran restaurant, a Jamaican restaurant, a French restaurant, a Brazilian restaurant, a Greek restaurant, and more. That does not count the fact that we're also very close to many hamburger restaurants and pizza restaurants, as well as fine dining ones too. Which finally brings us to the restaurants that have joined the delivery model because of the recent pandemic. I have noticed that many restaurants that previously did not offer delivery have begun to look at this model to keep their restaurants afloat. But now I know many people in the restaurant business that want to keep this as an extra supply of income for people who want fine dining but want to do it in the warmth of their own home. It would seem that those who run restaurants are now as resourceful as they ever used to be. So when we think of restaurants now, let us also think of the Capo Leon of Greece, the Thermopolium of Rome, dining out in China during the Song Dynasty, the taverns of Britain, the original restaurants of Paris, the fast food diners and automats of the United States, and all the restaurants from around the world that I can walk to now whenever I leave my house. And of course, never let us forget the people who run them and the people who work in them, people without whom I would never have a job. See you next week, folks. Make sure to check out the websites associated with this podcast at www.eatmyglobe.com where we will be posting the transcripts from each episode along with all the references and resources we used putting the episodes together in case you want to delve deeper into each subject. There is also a contact button, so please do let us know if there are any subjects that you would like us to cover. And if you like what you hear, please don't forget to join us on Patreon. Subscribe, recommend us to your family and friends, and give us a good rating on your favourite podcast provider. Thank you. Goodbye from me, Simon Majunda. We'll speak to you soon on the next episode of Eat My Globe. Things you didn't know you didn't know about food. The Eat My Globe podcast is a production of It's Not Much But It's Ours and Producer Girl Productions. We would also like to thank Sybil Villanueva for all of her help, both with the editing of the transcripts and essential help with the research.